Actually, I consider myself a peace builder and an educator. And education, both formal and informal, shapes society. And when I talk about peace building, I'm speaking of that through the lens of the definition of peace from the Earth Charter. And simply put, that is living in harmonious relationship with self, others, and all life. was my grandmother and as I and what you ask why uh, she was always there for others uh, and always watching out watching out for not just her own family but beyond the family circle and giving herself in selfless for those service. individuals who give of themselves in an everyday way uh, firefighters first response rescue folks uh, people who uh, take care of children and who go above and beyond uh, to make sure that needs are met, understanding that unmet needs drive behavior. So I guess my answer to that, then, Dee, is that heroes, for me, are the everyday heroes who give their unique contribution on behalf of the common good. In the early 20s, as a young coach, I quickly learned uh, that actually everyone has their own value and wisdom and unique contribution to make. And so really the best way to lead is in terms of education, leading forth or drawing out. And a sense of responsibility, I uh, found that out early on also, is really the key. When we take on personal responsibility in life and then shared responsibility, it's amazing. We all become leaders. And a group is a powerful force to be reckoned with on behalf of the good uh, when that happens. So definitely inspiration, inspiring everyone's inner leadership to come to the fore. A young athlete, extremely competitive, and it took me a while to understand the word competition, competere. So we petition with. And it's what the Olympics is based on. Uh, ra we raise or rise together. So when we learn that there is such a thing as cooperative competition, what happened for me, and I was a, coaching softball is where it happened, I began to understand that at every single position on that softball field was a unique, talented leader in her own right. And it was my job, my responsibility as a coach, not to tell that person what to do as much as to draw forth their uh, initiative and leadership. And once you have a team, of a, cooper a cooperative team effort, that can then be translated into any area. Uh, as you know, I have been in politics and business with the Maver Method and education and sports and non the nonprofit world. I've been very blessed with a rich life experience and have been able to take that shared responsibility, shared leadership model and really hone it over the years. Everyone's their own CEO. And it, it's a matter of learning the skills then, communication skills and the, those uh, that value set uh, unique to leadership from the inside out that for me makes the big difference. You can probably see it on the wall behind me here. I would say kindness and sometimes we call that compassion, call that empathy, it's slightly different definitions perhaps for each of those words. Uh, in my own experience, uh, I hearken to the Dalai Lama's uh, words. There's just one rule, and that rule is kindness. And if we all obeyed that one rule in life, it would be amazing. So as a leader, being able to express compassion and empathy, being genuinely kind, and there's a difference, D, between being nice and kind. And I've said that for years also. Sometimes you need to be very lovingly and even forcefully direct. 
and help set boundaries and whatever it is. Make sure that the bar remains uh, at a, a standard or quality level uh, in terms of the work that we're all doing uh, that makes an effective difference. Having said that, this does not take away from the fact that kindness uh, is the lens through which all of that is done. So I still believe that the strongest factor in life, the one that both binds us and bonds us, is love. And kindness, of course, is an expression of that. Actually, I shared a little bit earlier the words that I uh, wrap around that at this moment in life, I realized quite some time ago, probably two decades ago, uh, that wherever I was headed in life, it was essentially for me about inspiring cooperation on behalf of the common good, so that everyone has the capacity to recognize that they make a difference, that their contribution makes a difference in this world, and that joy is a special wisdom. So that is really my calling. And in a more arcane or esoteric sense, I have, you have probably heard me say over the years also, that I feel in my heart uh, the strong, compelling urge to help anchor and express the spirit of peace on this beautiful planet we all call home. Failure, uh, for me, is, is one of those words that is not part of my vocabulary. I don't see life like that, good or bad, right or wrong, failure, success. Uh, the way I perceive life is that we are all on this journey, which is a great journey of learning and refinement. And so I would say that where uh, people might think about failure, I think about refinement. And I learn ways that I could do some, there's like good, better, best, right? I might be able to do something good, it would be nice to be able to do it best, so there's always room for improvement. Uh, but I really don't look at life through a lens of failure. So I adhere to what Edison said when interviewed after the light bulb went on and he was asked, how did it feel to fail a thousand times, so many times? And he said, I didn't fail a thousand times, I learned a thousand ways it didn't work. things I've said for a long time is that the best way to connect with another is to be a good listener. And so deep listening and dialogue I, I think is a, a quality uh, set of skills for a leader also. And the best way to connect with another is to authentically listen to who they are as they speak, as they act, etc. And then reflect reflect on that and be able to meet them in a way that both acknowledges and appreciates who they are essentially. Uh, even when I'm uh, facilitating uh, something, I'll have people in the group who will say, it seems a little abstract, but the truth is it's not. There are just some very basic pragmatic skills in social emotional uh, intelligence, social emotional skill set. Uh, for example, eye contact and uh, being very present with another, and that's also good manners uh, if you think of cell phones and other things, but just really being present to the moment and present to the person and authentically showing up to make that connection. And what I learned through politics uh, intensely is it's really all about connecting, not convincing. So it's not so much about what I think or what I want to say or how things should go from my perspective, but truly about connecting with other and then having a shared experience. One that is a standout in my mind was when the powers that be decided that uh, he was not eligible for the New Hampshire debate. And of course we had met all the qualifications until just prior to the debate they changed some of the qualifications and we were the candidate that then didn't fit. And so I ended up uh, on, in quite a few conversations uh, with those who were handling that debate, 
and it was, uh, I think it was a good experience not only for me, but for many of our interns and staff at our office as well, as we talked that through and then took a national action, uh, flash mob action actually, the only time that I invited that to happen, and we did that through a lens of intentional kindness and intentionally getting a message out uh, of inclusiveness and fairness uh, in the spirit of the politics of hope. And sure enough, we ended up at the debate. So yes, I, I would say that has been part of my journey is to really learn to give voice uh, in a, again, as I said earlier, in a very direct and loving way and sometimes using intentional force and of course that would be consciously, but never in an angry or mean way though, always attempting to connect with other and raise, you know, polarization, it's like two points of a triangle, where is the common point of shared purpose, which I find is you are always able to find that if you're willing to let go and open to what's happening in the moment. And for me, that's a distinct quality of leadership, particularly in these times. These changing times are so challenging for any of us. For me, uh, if my parents were still alive in this moment, my dad in particular would tell you that I was born with this very a willful, truth-telling, absolute uh, capacity and willingness to speak my mind whether anybody asked or not. So, uh, so yes, there is something inherent in that. And yet, uh, even then, I, I, I'm not sure, even for the most extroverted person, how easy it is to really speak truth to power. And so I do think that for any of us, that is something that we, we learn that skill, that capacity, and particularly when we choose to do it, uh, I mean, anger itself, I think of anger as a fossil fuel. It burns hot, so but it's energy. So what do we do with that energy? How do we transmute and transform that, even in a given moment? so that we are able to stay connected because the minute you go to those kinds of emotional places it's very hard to stay connected with other and have a conversation that can lead to um, I want to say healthy resolution and my definition of health is a free flow of spirit through form my perspective this changing worldview presents a very unique challenge to leaders on the planet at this time. Uh, while we are still operating and co-operating in a, a paradigm and a way of thinking and doing business on the planet that ha has worked for a long time, it's now not working. It's used by data is up. But all the new forms and the new systems have not fully shown themselves. So leaders in this moment, it, no matter in what field, politics, business, nonprofit, name it, including education, everyone is challenged with one foot in a system that is fast breaking down. And it's painful, and in some cases we're trying to hold it together. And for me, that's kind of like trying to save a caterpillar in the midst of a chrysalis experience, only we don't get what the butterfly is yet with this shifting worldview. So as these new systems emerge, and for many thought leaders and cutting edge uh, visionaries, you've got definitely one foot in both, because you still have to do a certain amount of business in here, or you just can't get things done. It's because the fullness has not yet emerged. So I think that's probably the greatest challenge for leaders at this moment, is to be able to cast into what is emerging, even though it hasn't fully landed yet. And I stand with Buckminster Fuller there when, when he says, and I will crudely paraphrase, uh, don't fight the existing system or the prevailing system, create a system that works better, and the old will die of attrition. And we don't really have a choice right now because the, on this planet, all across the board, things that have worked, systems that have worked 
that have gotten us to where we are, they are all breaking down, which is the, the good news from my perspective. I've said something different even 10 years ago, but as I just shared this shifting worldview, we are on such, such, at such a threshold moment. So I would say the number one thing is follow your own heart. Be true to yourself, follow your heart, follow your intuition. And the, the second thing I would say is look for those ways to take whatever it is that you're leading into this next phase gracefully, lovingly, joyfully, and I will add, rather than fighting, we are all in this together, and if we can learn to cooperate that way, we'll be much better off, regardless of whether we agree or disagree about certain things or how to do certain things. So in terms of a, uh, a leader, a young or new leader stepping in, that's what I would say. Follow your heart and look for these ways with the new systems that will eventually be the prevailing systems to move into that with grace and ease and joy. Great Joys has been the few times I've uh, worked with David Cooper Ryder, founder of Appreciative Inquiry, and that has really helped inform my thinking about creative thinking and its importance in designing absolutely anything from a shopping cart to uh, a National Peace Academy. And uh, not only is it important, but it allows for every individual in a group to realize that they actually do have a contribution to make, often on a seed or thought level, imagination level, uh, regardless of how something manifests. So it's an inherent uh, self-worth exercise for a group also to, uh, to support that kind of creative intelligence and create creative spirit. So imagination is really important, giving quiet time, uh, some thought time. I'm, I'm not a big, big to-doer, although some people would look at my life and say, really? But that's not, that's not my lead foot. Uh, my lead foot is that we are human beings, not human doers, and that we really need time and space uh, to be self-reflective and allow that inner creative voice and mind to, to be present in the room. Otherwise, we're constantly moving on a very concrete level and we kind of lose the potential for really great visionary things to happen. Take the time to set those values and shared guidelines within which a group, particularly in an office environment, uh, will work. And they include things like no gossip, no criticism, being kind to one another, learning to communicate in that way. Uh, my, my grandmother always said, if you can't say something kind, then just don't say anything at all. I just like these kinds of skills personally and in group and in a work environment, uh, productivity goes up, never mind the happiness quotient.